Welcome to Inflammation and Aging, a webinar hosted by the Nathan Schock Centers of Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging. To get us started, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen N. Ostad, co-principal investigator of the Nathan Schock Centers Coordinating Center and the director of the Nathan Schock Center of Excellence at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Dr. Ostad is distinguished professor and chair of biology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham and is the scientific director of the American Federation for Aging Research. His research explores the evolution of life histories with a particular focus on the comparative biology of aging. This science ranges from comparative demography to molecular mechanisms of aging, and he has a longtime interest in variation in both cognitive and physical aging rates among primates and other animals. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Ostad. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and welcome everyone. Um, as many of you know, the Nathan Schock Centers of Excellence in the Basic Biology of Aging provide leadership in the pursuit of basic research into the biology of aging. It is a program with six centers uh, spread around the country, has been in existence since 1995. Today's uh, episode, uh, today's webinar, is uh, a continuation, really, or a, a distillation of a geroscience symposium that was held April 24th this year uh, at the Oklahoma, uh, University of Oklahoma Health Science Center and the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundations. So three of the speakers from that symposium um, were happy to have join us today. And uh, we can really think of this as a joint effort between the coordinating centers and the Oklahoma Nathan Shock Centers. Can I get the next slide, please? Uh, today, here are the topics that today's webinar will cover. The relationship between the biology of aging and inflammatory responses, pathways leading to inflammation, inflammation and age-associated diseases, senescence, the microbiome, and blood inflammatory mediators of aging, and interventions that can prevent inflammation. And if that sounds like a lot to cover uh, in an hour, you're right, it is. Um, the, the, the talks will be relatively short and we'll have plenty of time at the end of the talks uh, to take your questions. So I'd like to introduce the first speaker will be Dr. Luigi Ferrucci, who is the scientific director of the Intramural Research Program at the National Institute of Aging, also director of the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. And Dr. James Kirkland, who's professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic and director of that Clinic's COGOD Center on Aging. He will be our second speaker. Our third speaker will be Dr. Don Bodish, Associate Professor of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster University. So we look forward to hearing all three speakers. And at the end of the three talks, then we'll open it up to questions, and the questions can be for any of the presenters. So right now, I'd like to turn everything over to Dr. Ferrucci. Dr. Ferrucci? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, it's a, truly a pleasure to uh, present something about uh, inflammation. Uh, trying to make my slides behave. Okay, so so it, it's really a pleasure to talk about uh, inflammation and aging. This is one of the arguments that. Uh, has really characterized most of the research I have done over the last few years. Uh, inflammation, as you know, it's, it's a very, very important physiological function. We cannot live without immunity and inflammation. Inflammation really protects us both from the invasion of viruses and uh, bacteria, but also surveil the body, look for damage, uh, and then participate in, in the recognition of the damage and repair. However, the inflammation that we think of is an inflammation that looks like this. You know, if you look at the, the level of inflammatory marker over time, you will see that the two of the traditional inflammatory marker, IL-6 and CRP, tend to increase very rapidly. But CRP is a little bit slower. And then when the inflammation is no longer required, because the problem that determines inflammation is going to be solved, those inflammatory markers go down. Of course, 
is participation is a much more complex than that. Um, number of cells participate to this process. But the concept I want to go through is that uh, in, 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 it, it, it's the transient phenomenon. And during this transient phenomenon, most of the energy of the organism is dedicated to fighting the enemy. However, the inflammation we're talking today is a chronic inflammation. It's an inflammation that starts in a very mild and, you know, way. And then uh, we don't know exactly why it's starting. That we don't often recognize a specific phenomenon for it. Uh, it's not as strong and overt as the acute inflammation. And most of all, it does not go away. It remains for a very long time. And these are the very, very important consequence on the health of the individual. This is a, a slide from a study that was done in Italy. Many, many of the studies that I could show you, but this is important because uh, here we selected a very, very healthy population of men and women. And we found that both uh, the cytokines that are traditional inflammatory marker and, and acute phase reactive protein that are much more used in clinic uh, increase with aging. So it seems to be a characteristic of the aging process that uh, to some extent dissociated by the presence of not of disease. However, this inflammation, it's really important because epidemiologically we know that is associated with the higher risk of many, many chronic diseases. I don't really have the time to go through all of them, but you know, one of my favorite slides describing the effect of inflammation is a slide showing the effect of inflammation due to periodontal disease on the accumulation of beta amyloid. This is one of the studies, there are many others. But you can see both in those that have a genetic risk predisposition for Alzheimer's disease, uh, such as uh, apoE Apo carriers, uh, and those non apoE carriers, high clinical attachment loss, which is a measure of severity of periodontal disease associated with the larger and more severe deposition of beta amyloid, amyloid uh, measured through the PIB. Uh, compound uh, in, in, in PET imaging. But this is just one of the example. And to tell you how important it is, inflammation is uh, one of the strongest risk factors for the development of mobility disability. This is a study from uh, the EPI study showing that those individuals with 2.5 picogram milliliter or more of IL-6, one of the many inflammatory markers, there's a linear increase uh, in the risk of losing mobility four years later. And that you know how tragic uh, is the loss of mobility as an event in the life of an older person. Not only that, but uh, we know the inflammation is uh, probably the only risk factor that we know about uh, that is cross-sectionally and longitudinally associated with multimorbidity. Multimorbidity is a very, very important phenotype in the study of the aging process because show that the older individual develops susceptibility to multiple diseases. And so those who have elevated inflammation not only tend to have more disease, but also predisposed to have an increment of a disease or of the number of diseases over the following years. And as I told you, uh, there are very, very few epidemiological risk factors that have identified they have this association. Of uh, in spite of the consequence that are really very important, uh, both speculatively and clinically, we want to know where inflammation comes from. And, and in this slide, uh, I summarize, uh, you know, the many, many possible causes of inflammation that have been hypothesized uh, in the top part of this slide. Uh, and on the bottom, there are so many of the consequences where there is evidence, at least observation of epidemiological studies. And you can see that uh, cardiovascular disease, chronic disease, cancer, depression, dementia, osteoporosis, they all be connected with what we call inflammation. And the factors associated with inflammation are also many, many, many of which are mechanisms of the biology of aging. I would say that the two most important mechanisms that we now recognize as possible cause of inflammation or chronic inflammation with aging are those two, the uh, cellular senescence, 
and uh, the increase in gut permeability due to a change with aging in the microbiome. They create uh, some sort of loss of protection and damage uh, in this very important area. And so the two speakers that will come after me, uh, Jim will talk about uh, cellular uh, senescence and uh, Don will address uh, increased gut permeability and, uh, and, 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 and the microbiome um, uh, role uh, over the aging process. So Don, um, Jim, if you can talk about cellular senescence, if I, if I could just break in here for a second before you start, Dr. Kirkland, I'd like to remind uh, the people that are, that are viewing that uh, they can ask questions and you can type them into the Q&A box that you'll find on your screen. So, Dr. Kirkland? Thanks. Sorry. Having a bit of trouble here. So, as um, Dr. Froja was saying, um, one of the processes that appears to be upstream of or contribute to chronic low grade inflammation with aging is cellular senescence. And indeed, we're beginning to find that all the fundamental aging processes that Dr. Fruja um, referred to seem to be linked, such that if you target any one of them, you tend to, t to affect the rest. And also, as Dr. Fruja mentioned, these fundamental aging processes look like they might be root cause contributors to multiple chronic diseases, but also the geriatric syndromes, things like frailty or age-related muscle impairment as well as decreased physical resilience or decreased ability to um, uh, respond to a stress, for example, to recover after surgery or to mount an immune response after vaccination. So cellular senescence is um, a process that was discovered in the early 1960s, whereby normally prol proliferating cells stop dividing, but it turns out non-dividing cells can also acquire a senescence-like state. Uh, these cells are resistant to dying. Some senescent cells become very large, have increased protein production, and may exhibit um, a secretory state where they produce inflammatory mediators, chemokines that attract immune cells, and other factors that damage tissues around them. So these senescent cells themselves resist dying from the things that they're producing that kill cells around them or cause dysfunction at a distance. In many ways, senescent cells resemble cancer cells that can't divide metabolically as well. So um, senescent cells tend to appear at the sites of age-related diseases, but also other chronic diseases, even in younger individuals. They also accumulate in with um, aging in people who don't exhibit much in the way of overt chronic disease, but eventually will. So that with natural aging, senescent cell abundance begins to particularly increase in the um, ages between 60 and 80. What the slide here shows is senescent cells in fat tissue. Um, in uh, people who are healthy, these are kidney transplant donors, so they're healthy individuals. The older individuals have more senescent cells in their fat tissue than the younger individuals. So some senescent cells, as I mentioned, have increased protein production, have increased production of inflammatory mediators that are other than proteins, things like bradykines and prostanoids. Uh, they can produce non-coding uh, nucleotides of some of various sorts that contribute to inflammation, like various microRNAs, or even uh, DNA, free DNA acts as a damage signal to other cells and induces inflammation. Small numbers of senescent cells, if they're transplanted into younger individuals, can cause an aging-like state. What this slide shows is if you transplant just a million senescent cells into a mouse such that one out of 10,000 cells in that mouse is a transplanted senescent cell, this is sufficient to make the mice die early, to become frail, and when they die earlier, they die of all age-related diseases, and they exhibit inflammation um, within their various tissues and in the blood. Uh, 
So very small numbers of senescent cells are sufficient to cause problems. There's a threshold as well of senescent cells that will cause problems. Once you exceed that threshold, senescent cells cause formation of um, other cells to cause other cells near them and, and at a distance to become senescent. So senescence spreads from cell to cell. The immune system normally clears senescent cells. Once the rate of formation of new senescent cells exceeds the ability of the immune system to clear them, you get a takeoff in senescent cells, an exponential increase in their numbers, and start getting um, age-related disorders, diseases, uh, including things like frailty. So a number of years back, we set out to try to develop drugs that would selectively kill the senescent cells that are trying to kill cells around them. And the way we did this was to look and we asked why senescent cells survive the conditions that they're creating, which kill normal cells. And what we found is they have upregulation of pro-survival pathways through which they defend themselves against their own pro-apitotic senescence-associated secretory phenotype. It turns out there's a network of these pro-survival pathways. Uh, there are a number of them, at least eight, and they're networked together. If you transiently disable these networks by using drugs that hit multiple targets within them, uh, you can allow senescent cells to basically kill themselves. They commit suicide because of the factors they're producing. That's how senolytic drugs work. So they only need to be present at high concentration for half an hour, and then senescent cells die usually within about 18 hours, provided they're producing things that are trying to cause inflammation or cell death um, of cells around them. So on the top, um, uh, two panels on the histogram on the right of your slide, uh, we show what happens if you take senescent, non-senescent cells, I should say, put a label in them and transplant them into animals and then treat those animals with senolytic drugs. And in this case, the senolytic drugs are the combination of desatinib and carcetin, but there are many more combinations or many more drugs that work now. The senolytic drugs do not kill the normal cells in the top um, uh, bar graph. In the, in the bottom one on the right of your screen, the senescent cells uh, are killed by these drugs, whereas uh, treating animals with vehicle does not kill the cells. We find generally that 30 to 70% of senescent cells are killed by these uh, kinds of drugs, and that roughly correlates with the abundance, the percentage of senescent cells that are trying to kill other cells and that are inflammatory. So there are many disease states now in mouse models where treatment with these agents intermittently appears to alleviate dysfunction. Senescent cells take two to six weeks to form. The drugs work within around 18 hours. So these drugs can be given once every couple of weeks or once a month if there's continuing drive for new senescent cells to form. They do not have to be continuously present. They work in a hit and run manner. So in the case of uh, diabetes associated with obesity induced by high fat feeding in mice, senescent cells accumulate in the fat tissue as shown in the panel on the left where there are the photographs and the, the dark blue um, uh, staining fat tissue is uh, uh, the reaction uh, showing uh, senescence associated beta-galactosidase, a marker of senescence. If we treat animals with these drugs intermittently once every couple of weeks, uh, despite no change in weight on the high fat diet, we find that senescent cells decrease and we find that we improve insulin tolerance, we improve intraperitoneal glucose tolerance testing and insulin clamp testing we find that there's improved insulin sensitivity. We also get decreased complications of diabetes in these animals, less renal dysfunction, uh, less hepatic fat or liver steatosis, less anxiety driven by senescent-like cells that uh, appear in the brain in the context of obesity and uh, interfere with limbic system function, and a long list of other things. So I don't have time to go through them all, but there are at least 40 conditions now in uh, experimental animal models where targeting senescent cells appears to have some kind of um, uh, effect uh, alleviating uh, dysfunction. And you'd expect this if, like other fundamental aging processes, cellular senescence is a, is a root cause contributor to multimorbidity. If we um, treat older animals, 
these are equivalent to 80 or 90 year old uh, humans. Uh, if we treat older mice with these uh, senolytic drugs, we alleviate frailty in these animals. They're able to do better. Uh, if they, they're able to hang on to a wire longer, they're able to run faster, uh, their grip strength is improved. And they have a delay in onset of age-related diseases as a group and die a bit later than other um, similarly old animals treated with a vehicle. Recently in humans, we've shown that this same drug combination works to clear senescent cells from uh, adipose tissue and skin. Uh, as well as to decrease uh, factors produced by senescent cells in the blood, including inflammatory mediators like the IL-6 that Dr. Faruja mentioned. And what, what we're showing here is measuring fat tissue biopsies at day zero, giving a three-day course of these drugs orally, and then 11 days later, after the completion of that course of drugs, taking a fat, another fat tissue biopsy and looking for markers of senescence. These drugs are cleared from the circulation within a day, so they act in a hit and run manner. And as I mentioned before, it takes a while for new senescent cells to form. So it looks like, as in animals, we're able to clear these cells in people. In an early, very early clinical trial um, that needs to be replicated and with the right placebo controls and everything else, in patients with a condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is relentlessly progressive and fatal in humans, and we know is associated with senescent cell accumulation in the lungs, these people get frailty and um, uh, weight loss and other problems. We found that in mice, if we treat um, mice that, are, that have a, mo a mouse model of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, we are able to alleviate physical dysfunction. We found in people an early indication that we're able to achieve the same thing. So um, in a very small study, giving nine doses of these drugs over a three-week period and looking five days after the last dose, we were able to see an improvement in their walking distance, their gait speed, their ability to rise from a chair, and their short physical performance battery. Uh, this was associated with decreased markers of inflammation, and it's using the same drugs as I showed you in the previous slide, uh, that we know clear senescent cells, um, at least partially, from humans. So in conclusion, um, I, I didn't have time to go through all of this, but senolytic drugs um, are designed to kill senescent cells. So their target is senescent cells. It's not a single molecule they're targeting. It's not a biochemical pathway. It's senescent cells. They, uh, and again, I didn't have time to go through this, but they appear to... Um, alleviate the progenitor dysfunction that occurs with aging. And one of the mechanisms through which insulin responsiveness is improved in the context of obesity is improved uh, adipose progenitor function and um, ability of these cells to differentiate into insulin responsive fat cells. They certainly alleviate tissue inflammation. Uh, in that human study, we found not only were senescence markers decreased, in adipose tissue, but also macrophage infiltration because senescent cells attract, anchor, and activate immune cells. And we also found decreases in, as I mentioned, IL-6 and other circulating inflammatory mediators in those same subjects. It looks like in animal models, at least, that intermittent treatment may be effective. And we do find in humans that long after the drugs are gone, we can still observe a decrease in senescent cell abundance, suggesting that when we come to larger trials, it may be um, possible to go to hit and run treatment and give these drugs uh, once every couple of weeks or once a month. In mice at least, as you'd expect if you're targeting a fundamental aging process, we looks like we're able to delay or alleviate multiple chronic diseases and enhance health span. But that said, when we go to people, everything can go wrong. Um, we have a long way to go. The clinical trials that have been done are very small, very preliminary. Uh, they are not, they're, they're not uh, placebo controlled, they're, they're before and after studies, so they need to be replicated. We need to test these drugs in multiple other conditions. We need to assure that these agents are safe, uh, which we don't know yet, um, and we need to do double-blind randomized placebo controlled trials. Until then, people should not take these drugs. They should absolutely not take these drugs, except in the context of a carefully monitored, academically or commercially operated, controlled clinical trial. So people should not be self-medicating with them. Uh, we don't know what the adverse effects are going to be. 
and um, we're working and others are working as hard as possible and as fast as possible to see if we can replicate the promising results in the very early trials, but um, I'd emphasize those results are very preliminary at this point. So um, I'll pass on to uh, Don now. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kirkland. It's very exciting stuff. Dr. Bodish? Hi there, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and be able to share some of our work with you. Um, so today before I start, I wanna tell you a fact that I find actually humbling and amazing, even though I've been with it for quite some time here. So a full 25% of your daily calories goes just to replacing and maintaining your immune system. And of that 25%, half of that is believed to go to controlling the microbes that live in your gut. So our gut microbiome, I don't seem to be able to advance. Oops. Okay. So our gut uh, microbiome is a fundamental part of our biology. It's required for nutrient acquisition. It's required for many things. And it's also a fundamental component of our immune responsiveness. So as an example, there's this process of immune education that happens in the gut. Our immune cells, which live in the, the layer underneath the gut, are constantly sampling those microbes. And they're making decisions about which are pathogens who we need to respond to and which are commensal organisms that we shouldn't respond to. This immune education goes back and forth because over time what we essentially do is we, we weed our microbial garden and we pick out pathogens and keep bacteria that have beneficial or are harmless. Now, what you can probably get from this is that as the immune system ages, it loses some of this farming capacity, this ability to monitor and to, to prune certain microbes. And as this microbial composition shifts, it can lead to consequences for this fundamental role of immune activation. And this ultimately leads to what we call microbial dysbiosis or a harmful or unhealthy change in the, in the gut microbiome. The first person to suggest that the gut microbiome was actually the famous cell biolog biologist, Eli Metchnikoff. Uh, no matter how clever we think we scientists are, there's always somebody who thought of the idea first. And he was really fascinated with the aging process. And so what he would do is he would take autopsy samples of older animals or older people, and he would, he would look very carefully at the gut. Although he wasn't able to see gross changes in the structure of the gut, what he noticed is that the immune cells that lived underneath the gut, so those immune cells there, they had a phenotype which he called intoxified. He knew from his studies of infection that when macrophages or other immune cells are in the process of a fulminant infection that's overwhelming, they will find, uh, they will become unable to phagocytose or to eat those bacteria. And they'll have this, what they, he called the angry phenotype. What, and what we now know means that they're producing a lot of inflammatory mediators. So because he can make these observations about what these macrophages look like, he hypothesized that the aged gut was becoming leaky and allowing either bacteria or bacterial products into touching these macrophages and causing them to produce this inflammation. But where the real brilliance of his observations were was that he also took slices of brains of the same humans or animals who died. And he found that these intoxified macrophages were also found in the brain. So he hypothesized that these bacterial products were making their way through that leaky gut and were getting into either the blood or the lymph and circulating throughout the body. In fact, he was the first person to propose that diseases of age, including what was then called senility, were caused by systemic inflammation. Now, Eli Metchnikoff was brilliant, but he was also ridiculed for some of his theories. And one of the things we tried to do in our lab was uh, prove or disprove this hypothesis. So the first thing we did is we aged what are called germ-free mice. So if you're not familiar with these mice, these are mice that grow up without any microbes on or in them. They're born by cesarean section, all their food is completely sterile. They're never allowed to, to encounter a microbe. And in some data that I'm not showing you here, we could show that these mice that had no microbiome had no systemic inflammation and many measures of health were improved. 
that's not very practical, of course. So what we wanted to determine was whether the old microbiome had any of these microbes that were problematic and caused this inflammation or this intestinal permeability. So if you're not familiar with looking for these plots, this is basically just a summary of what the microbiome of a young or old mouse looks like. And you can see, if we look on the left here, you can see that there are some, like the purple bars here that might increase with age, some that might appear, some microbes that might appear with age that weren't there before. And sometimes there's also some reductions like this one at the top here. And so what we were able to do is we were able to house these germ-free mice, either young or old, with a normal mouse that was either young or old. And you can see that what would happen, irrespective of the age of the recipient mouse, is if they're housed with a young mouse, they pick up the young microbiome. And if they're housed with an old mouse, they pick up the old microbiome. So this allowed us to study the intersection between the age of the microbiome and the age of the host. And what we found was this. I've, li I've listed the link to the paper if you'd like to read all the details, but I'll give you the synopsis. The mice that picked up a young microbiome did not have this intestinal permeability, nor did they develop systemic inflammation, irrespective if the mouse itself was young or old. On the other hand, any of the mice that lived with the mouse that had an old microbiome did in fact become, have uh, systemic inflammation and intestinal permeability, indicating that it was the composition of the microbiome that led to these two factors. And current work, ongoing work in the lab, is identifying which species are problematic in this context. So essentially, the take-home message here is that you need to take care of your microbiome because it might be the key to the long and healthy life. We've already heard about how systemic inflammation can contribute to basically every ill effect of aging. And so here uh, is the model that we're building. All of us have slightly permeable guts. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to get our foods and nutrients from that. This does allow for the translocation of bacterial products. And once these products are in the circulation, we have systemic inflammation. In youth, we can probably clear these products fairly quickly. However, the systemic inflammation affects the very immune cells that are required to keep that gut microbiome under control. And so over time, the systemic inflammation contributes to microbial dysbiosis, which then also leads to this increased permeability. And so the cycle carries on. And the reason I like these data so much is that it really explains a lot of the epidemiology of what we know it takes to live a long and healthy life. So as an example, there's a huge economic disparity about how well you live. And we know that this is because of things like changes in diet and lifestyle and other choices or chances that we have based on socioeconomics. So for example, diets that are high in fat tend to solubilize these bacterial products and bring them into the circulation. We know that systemic inflammation is increased by everything, like chronic stress, smoking, uh, living in an unsafe or unhealthy workplace. We also know that what you, your microbiome really wants you to eat is fiber, lots of it. And having a high fiber diet is not compatible with having a low income. So we know that this cycle spins a lot faster for those who are unable to feed their microbiome. On the other hand, we know that people who are able to have a low-fat diet, to live safe and relatively healthy lives, and to feed their microbes the fiber they so desire, tend to have longer, healthier lives. So with that, I'd like to finish off. I'm so excited to be answering any questions that you have during the Q&A period. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Bodish, and thanks to all of the speakers. And uh, we have a, a number of outstanding questions, so I look forward to uh, hearing what some of you have to say. I, th I think I'll direct the first one towards Dr. Ferrucci, but uh, the others feel free to chime in. Uh, all three of you have mentioned inflammaging as a, as, as a key factor in aging. So a, a very simple-minded question would be, what if we just take anti-inflammatories? Is that going to keep us from aging, Dr. Ferrucci? Hello, Dr. Ferrucci. Well, uh, Dr. Bodish, would you like to take that while well, Dr. Ferrucci is trying to get his mic? Um, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, sorry. Um, you know, this is a, a question that I get all the time. Uh, of course, when I said before, inflammation is such an important mechanism that, that we cannot live without inflammation. So if we turn now inflammation completely, 
we will not have the consequence of chronic inflammation, but we will not have the information to help us in the situation when we need it. And so there are a number of side effects of uh, turning down inflammation chronically and all the drugs that affect inflammation have important consequences. In some cases, inflammation is overt. So taking drug for inflammation is the best approach. The second issue is that, uh, you know, although inflammation is, uh, you know, one of the uh, associated risks for many diseases, uh, I think is a symptom of something that is underneath is happening. And uh, two examples from the previous speakers, even if I reduce the inflammation that comes from senescent cells, the senescent cell will still be there and will have uh, their deleterious effect. Even though I can reduce the inflammation that uh, you know, is due to the penetration, for example, of bacteria from the gut, uh, you know, the penetration of bacteria will still occur. And so all the consequences of having this uh, intestinal permeability will still be there. So I think that uh, the approach of inflammation to inflammation is go to the root cause rather than looking at the molecule that are demonstrating that inflammation is occurring. Okay, okay thank you. Any, uh, either of you, others uh, wanna add anything to that? I guess I, if I could, um, nature's anti-inflammatory is exercise. So uh, we already know that that's something we need to do to, to uh, live a long and healthy life. And at least partially the effects are mediated by reducing uh, systemic inflammation. So as much as we would all like a pill because that's easier, conventional wisdom <laughs> states that exercise is really a way we should all be considering. Thank you, Doug. To, to amplify Dr. Fruge's uh, point, um, in the case of senescence, at least, senescent cells don't just produce inflammatory factors. And some of those inflammatory factors will not respond to the usual anti-inflammatory drugs, by the way. In addition, they produce proteases. They produce things that attract immune cells and activate them. They produce stem cell poisons, uh, family members related to TGF-beta and activin A. And they produce a lot of other things that will cause inflammation-like responses, including microRNAs and nucleus, um, various, various uh, uh, nucleotides that um, are not susceptible to the usual anti-inflammatory drugs. So um, there, there, there are differences between, it, it isn't just inflammation that's occurring, at least in the context of cellular senescence. There are other things that are going on that can be detrimental. That said, you also need to be able to form senescent cells. Senescent cells are a defense against cancer. So if you can't form a senescent cell in response to a DNA mutation, you, you can't um, fight cancer properly. So what you don't want to do is interfere with pathways that allow a cell to become senescent. You want to get rid of senescent cells once they're there because many of them are precancerous cells. All right, thank you. I, that actually leads into uh, one of the other questions that we have here, which is, can senescent cells develop drug resistant like cancer cells do? One good thing about they're not dividing is unlike cancer cells or microbes, at least they cannot develop um, uh, replication dependent drug resistance because they don't divide. Um, different kinds of senescent cells though depend on different sets of survival pathways to survive. So, and senescent cells evolve over time. So um, they, they change in the kinds of things they produce and in the nature of pathways that reinforce senescence over time. Eventually, for example, senescent cells start producing a lot of transposable elements, line one elements. This takes about three or four months before that occurs. That activates inflammation through a different set of pathways than the initial phase of senescence, where the inflammatory pathways are related to things like NF-kappa B. So the, the starting cell type, the cause of initiation of senescence, the amount of time a, a senescent cell has been around, and its microenvironment determine what it produces. Uh, the inflammation in senescent cells, or at least some of the factors they produce, can be regulated by hormones like glucocorticoids, can be decreased by drugs like metformin or rapamycin in a segmental manner. So the, the secretory state of senescent cells is very complex. Even the definition of senescent cells is complex. There isn't uniform agreement about that. And certainly the 
kinds of drugs that can be used to clear them differ depending very much on their stage of development and, and, um, and what cell type they came from. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Kirkwood. Uh, here's a question for Dr. Bodich. It's a sort of chicken and egg question. Is the uh, microbiome changes with age due to changes in the intestine or is uh, changes in the intestine causing changes in the microbiome? So that's a great question. And I, I have to say, if I'm being totally honest, our data suggests it's both. So I think one of the reasons I draw it as a circle because it appears to be a circle. So once upon a time, we used to think that the microbiome, you know, you got some bad bugs and that caused an inflammatory response. But what we're now learning is that the process of inflammation allows a lot of reactive oxygen and other uh, sort of electron donors and acceptors. And some of the microbes can really capitalize on that. So what ends up happening is you have an outgrowth of specific bacteria that can use those inflammatory metabolites. So this is why it really is a cycle because you can have changes in gut physiology which allow maybe some of the immune cells broader access to those microbes. Once they have that, it's entirely possible that they're gonna have an inflammatory response. Once they have that inflammatory response, there's an um, oxidative microenvironment that favors some microbes over the other. And so on the cycle goes. So it really does seem to be a chicken and egg. And in our, um, in our research, we can actually prove or disprove it in both directions. So if we block the inflammatory microbiome, we can prevent the dysbiosis. If we have the dysbiosis, we can cause an inflammatory microenvironment. So this is really why it truly is a circle. So, so following up on that is an interesting question here, asking, is there a link between different microbiomes and the number of senescent cells? I guess that would be Dr. Bodish or Dr. Kirkwood or Dr. Ferrucci. Who'd like to take that one? I'm embarrassed to say we've never looked, so I'll have to defer to the other two speakers. Again, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I sense the collaboration. <laughs> I don't know either. There is a lot of senescent cells that occur in the intestinal layers for sure, but whether they are connected with the microbiome, I couldn't say, I never read anything like that, but certainly a very interesting question. Okay, thank you. So here, here's a question, I guess for Dr. Kirkwood, if senescent cells are cleared from tissues with senolytics, uh, does this require a maintenance dose or is there any indication that at some point the cells stop becoming senescent in the tissue and you, don't, you can discontinue uh, the treatment? It depends on the driver. Um, for example, we found that giving a single dose of radiation to the leg of a younger mouse, such that it has trouble walking on that leg and the hair over the leg turns gray after a couple of months, um, you can give uh, a single short course of senolytics, you know, three or four days of them in that mouse's lifespan, and that alleviates the problem from then on because there's no continued um, impetus driving new senescent cell formation in that situation. In the case of osteoarthritis, on the other hand, in, in some work we're about to um, uh, try to get published, one of the things that can induce senescence in the case of osteoarthritis is mechanical stress. So shear stress, bone-on-bone -bone stress will induce cellular senescence. We find in that situation in experimental animals that we have to give the drug once every two weeks. Uh, similarly, with high-fat feeding, where there's a continued drive to develop new senescent cells, we have to, at least in animals, give the drugs once every two weeks or once a month. So it depends on the stimulus and whether that stimulus uh, driving senescence is still there or not. All right, thank you. Um, here's a question perhaps for uh, Dr. Ferrucci. No one has mentioned sleep. I wonder if there are any animal studies that support the role of sleep, sleep quality, or sleeping time in uh, developing uh, uh, symptoms of aging. Yeah, I mean, the, so, so in, in the sleep, it, it's another really essential physiological mechanism. And we know they interfere with a number of, uh, you know, physiological function and also pathological function. So there is uh, clear epidemiological evidence that people that have disturbed sleep or sleep then less than seven hours per night uh, or fragmented sleep tend to have uh, high inflammatory markers. Not only that, but they also tend to have insulin resistance, uh, which is uh, 
somewhat connected with inflammation as well. Uh, and, and also we have uh, uh, this point clear evidence that uh, fragmented sleep is associated with uh, accumulation of uh, beta amyloid in the brain in the area that are typically where the accumulation occurred because of Alzheimer's disease. So clearly sleep, uh, it, it, it's a, a very, very important protective mechanism against a number of disease uh, and disturbed sleep it may have important health consequences uh, and also participate to accelerate the aging phenotype. I'm not sure everybody will look at senescence uh, directly in relation to sleep, and I'm going to ask this question to Jean, which may know more than me. All right, thank you. So here's an interesting question on diet and fasting. Fa various types of fasting diets are, are getting increasing attention these days. Is there any indication that the uh, autophagy that fasting stimulates will actually decrease the number of senescent cells? Uh, Dr. Kirkland, would you like to take that one? Um, I don't know that it's autophagy that's doing it, but um, there have been studies done, including ones here by Nathan Labrasser, showing that exercise, for example, in the case of high fat feeding will reduce senescent cell abundance. We know that um, uh, caloric restriction, this was work done by Norm Sharpless uh, ages ago, who's now uh, commissioner of the FDA. He showed back in 2004 that um, dietary restriction uh, in mice delays um, accumulation of senescent cells. Um, so that's been known for a long time. Uh, there needs to be a lot more work done on the relationship of diet and different kinds of diet to um, uh, preventing or causing accumulation of senescent cells. But it's clear that, for example, things like high glucose, 33 millimolar glucose, will drive cells to become senescent. Various ceramides will do it. Particular fatty acids will do it. Um, so there, uh, even even in vitro. So there, there are links between what's in the, in the diet and formation of senescent cells. Furthermore, with respect to the microbiome, it's becoming clear that um, bacterial antigens, for example, will, um, we don't know if they'll necessarily cause senescence, but they'll make senescent cells become much more pro-inflammatory. So, um, uh, so some of the antigens uh, that are associated with uh, gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria will drive a senescent cell's pro-inflammatory state to be much more severe. So their inflammatory state is very dynamic. All right, thank you. Um, here's a question, uh, maybe this is for Dr. Ferrucci because it's really about public health efforts. Uh, it, the question is, Dr. Bodish mentioned socioeconomic discrepancies that contribute to inflammation. How much are lower socioeconomic communities represented in research and are they being targeted in public health efforts? I mean, there, there is clear evidence that uh, socioeconomic status has an important uh, effect on many of the aging phenotypes, including inflammation, and there is a uh, effect on mortality and disability that is really, really, really strong. There is a gradient uh, on the survival and health expectancy across uh, the different range of socioeconomic status that have been demonstrated in many countries and across countries. Um, the way this work, uh, um, it, it's, it's not only in the immediate effect uh, of, of uh, low socioeconomic status, but uh, work across the entire lifespan. It's been demonstrated, for example, that uh, low socioeconomic status is uh, more effective in, effect in, in, you know, producing bad health outcome when occur prior to menarche or even the first 10 years of to 12 years of life. And so there's something occurring there that is related to nutrition, clean water, and you know, other you know, effect that, that uh, it's clearly have uh, transport uh, these uh, you know, epigenetic signal that probably later in life uh, had deleterious effect. What do we do about it? Uh, that's a very good question. And, and you know, we don't do very much about it. And I think that, that that's a really a question that is need to be addressed uh, much more strongly. I think that especially in the earliest year of life, uh, public health intervention that affect this pathway 
could have the incredibly strong effect uh, on reducing the burden of disease uh, and disability in old age. And I'm sure that if we look at socioeconomic status and microbiome and senescence and burden, um, you know, if we could do that population level, it would be really, really a strong effect. Thank you. Dr. Bodish, do you have anything to add to that from a Canadian perspective? <laughs> well, um, I, I have a lot of opinions, most of which I'll keep to myself, but I think, you know, the, the uh, Dr. Frucci really summarized it. It's, it's, the data is clear. We can find cord blood of babies born to parents who have, who have had adversity or live under low socioeconomic class have higher levels of inflammation. We can see at six months of age, there are studies showing that there are predictive markers of poor aging. Um, as a result of, of socioeconomic class. So I think as a society, what we need to do is really invest in those early, that early life environment. Um, and uh, as scientists, I think for those of us who do human studies, it's important for us to do lots of outreach to get participants from all, um, all areas of life. There's a lot of science right now about how Western industrialized educated populations aren't representative of the entire uh, population. And, uh, and yet I think we sort of self-select for participants in our studies who have the means and ability to come and join us in our studies. So I think it does behoove us all if we do human research to really go out into our communities and make sure we provide opportunities for everyone to participate. Thank, thank you. Um, Dr. Kirkland, uh, you mentioned that senescence can be seen in non-dividing cells as well. And so uh, one of the listeners was wondering how senolytic drugs uh, impact post-mitotic cells. Like, like neurons or cardiomyocytes later in life? Um, Joao Passos and uh, Thomas von Zaniski have written quite extensively about this, and the, uh, particularly in the case of senescent cardiomyocytes, they are removed um, by some of these interventions and um, uh, heart remodeling follows. Um, it looks like, even though it's a very controversial area, um, with respect to cardiac progenitor cells, there's been a lot of recent controversy, but there's been some very good work coming out of London um, showing that um, you can get restoration of cardiomyocytes um, by reinvigoration of progenitor cells that lead to um, new cardiomyocytes. Similar sort of thing is found in muscle, um, where there are non-dividing um, cells that are very complex and have multiple nuclei. Uh, they, they, can, they can also be partly cleared by senolytic agents and replaced. As far as neurons, um, uh, there are senescent uh, neurons that uh, occur, at least they have mark senescent-like, I call it. They have markers of senescence. I don't think we're really clear on whether they're cleared or not um, by these drugs and what happens, because in the brain, the main senescent cell type that is affected by these drugs are astrocytes. Uh, there is a oligodendrocyte function that gets restored though when you remove astrocytes, senescent astrocytes, and there's some remyelination that occurs. But as far as neurons go, um, there is neurogenesis that can be improved in various parts of the brain by these drugs. Uh, several groups, including a group in the NIH, recently showed that, the NIA. Um, but um, what happens to senescent-like neurons I don't think is entirely clear at this point. A lot of work needs to be done. All right, thank you. So, so here's, a, here's a, something that either Dr. Bodish or Dr. Uh, Kirkland or Dr. Ferrucci could answer. Let, Dr. Bodish, why don't I uh, send this your way first. In, in terms of uh, increased cellular senescence in the gut microbiome, what about centenarians or people that seem to age particularly successfully? Do they have different uh, degrees of cellular senescence and a different microbiome? There's been some absolutely fascinating studies on the microbiomes of centenarians and supercentenarians, so people who live past 110. And yes, they seem to have fundamentally different microbiomes. Now, it's a little bit unclear because, of course, we don't have any control people if you, who, who are also alive at that stage. So it does not appear as though they're on a straightforward trajectory. It doesn't appear as though they just have an aging microbiome that gets older as they get older. It does appear to have some special features to it. So there's specific microbes that seem to be overrepresented. They seem to be particularly good at making short chain fatty acids for their age group. Um, and what's also interesting is their study of frail older adults and frail older adults seem to have a microbiome which is different than their age matched peers as well and is less functional. So we, we're really 
really unclear right now about did these supercentenarians and centenarians, did they start with a particularly gifted microbiome and just maintain it through life? Are they more resistant to some of the changes? Are they acquiring new species that some of us aren't? We're unclear right now, but it is clear that they seem to have a very functional microbiome into old age. Thank you. Dr. Kirkland, do you have anything to say about senescence and centenarians? Um, there aren't a lot of data, but there are data showing, as Dr. Uh, Frucci could probably go into, that um, inflammatory mediators that tend to be associated with cellular senescence tend to be lower in those populations. What we can talk about is sort of the mouse version of centenarians, things like Ames dwarf mice or growth hormone receptor um, uh, knockout mice. Um, these animals have many fewer senescent cells than uh, um, non-mutant um, animals, you know, of the, of the same background. And it looks like one of the drivers of senescence that occurs with respect to um, different life expectancies, as it were, across most species is IGF-1 so, um, uh, and growth hormone signaling. So IGF-1 can drive um, uh, cells to become senescent. Persistent low-grade IGF-1 uh, stimulation will do that. And some of the pathways have been worked out which um, are related to that. So there does appear, at least in animal models, to be a relationship between the growth hormone and IGF-1 axis to susceptibility to senescence. And that axis is also frequently different in uh, human centenarians than non-centenarians, with uh, the human centenarian population having eff effectively lower IGF-1 signaling uh, quite often than the rest of the population. But that's all circumstantial. There aren't, as far as, uh, there may be studies out there um, comparing centenarians directly to uh, non centenarians uh, as far as human studies go, but that would be very difficult to do. Um, you know, the markers of senescence are tricky um, and so forth. So I, I haven't seen those data, but they may exist. But certainly in most models, it seems to be the case. All right, thank you. Um, Dr. Ferrucci, here's uh, a question. Well, if I can add one thing, of course, the sure. study on uh, inflammation has been done in Centenaria, most in Italy. This is uh, Claudio Franceschi work. And then the, you know, they show that not only they tend to have a little bit less inflammation, but some of the gene variants uh, that are associated with lower inflammation tend to be more prevalent in Centenarians. I wanted to add one thing, you know, we, we, we look about inflammation by looking at one or two specific cytokines, but, but uh, some of the emerging science uh, is looking at uh, proteomics in, in the blood, you know, is looking at multiple proteins that seem to change with aging uh, in the blood. And, and it's, uh, it's peculiar, and I don't want to speculate too much, that uh, many of these uh, cluster of protein that increase with aging seems to be senescent associated secondary phenotype. They seem to be deriving from senescent cells. And what we see is that uh, that trend uh, is really, really strong up to the age of 80, 85, and then above the age of 85, but of course we have few people at that age in our database so far, that seem to be kind of um, holding uh, stable. And so it is possible that when we will start to study, you know, older, older individuals, not only inflammation will be lower, but all those biomarkers that we find uh, uh, age correlated in the blood that will also look different. But, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm speculating the future. Thank you. So we have time for just one or two more questions. Um, here's one, I guess this is right in your wheelhouse, Dr. Bodish. Is there a microbiome cocktail that, uh, that a, an old person could take that would make them young again or would slow the aging process. I want to know this as well. Yes, <laughs> we all do. Well, unfortunately, no. And I mean, one of the issues is you grow up with your microbiome. You and your microbiome, you grow together. And so really the best thing you could do for your microbiome is have your very own microbiome when you were young. It's really not safe or healthy or a good idea to try to do fecal transplants or anything like that because that's not your microbiome. Um, so we don't know yet. We're working on it. We're trying to find species that have specific functions. But honestly, the best thing you can do is feed your good microbes and they love fiber. They want you to eat as much fiber as you possibly can. So that's one of the best things. The Mediterranean diet, as it turns out, is not just good for your physiology, but is good for your microbiome. So I think that's the take-home message, is there's no uh, 
quick fix yet, although we are certainly trying to find out which specific species we should target for elimination. And the idea is that just like the analytics, we might be able to de design vaccinations to get rid of the bad bugs, or which are truly beneficial, and uh, those we might end up supplementing with one day. But as of yet, I'm afraid all you can do is feed the good microbes. All right, thank you. So maybe we can finish up with one more question and then I'll turn things back over to the hosts. Um, here's a question, Are, do different mouse genotypes have different susceptibilities to cellular senescence and do they respond differently to senolytics? Because that would certainly have uh, relevance for humans as genetically diverse as they are. Dr. Kirkland, would you like to take that? Yeah, um, you find the shorter lived, uh, the particular mouse strain, the more senescent cells you tend to see. Um, you know, the exact causation of that is difficult to know. As I mentioned, um, there's a clear link with um, IGF-1 and longevity of certain mouse strains, and you can, there is, there does appear to be sort of an established relationship there. Um, but, um, it, you know, it, again, this is something that deserves a, a lot more study. And certainly in humans, we really don't have any idea about that at this point. All right. Thank you. Well, I, I thank all the speakers and I also thank all the listeners and the people who provided questions. And I'm sorry we didn't get to answer all of them because there's some really good questions we didn't get to. So I, I thank everyone else and um, I'll turn things back over to the host. Thank you. Thank you all. This was fascinating. Um, you will all be receiving a link to a uh, survey about this webinar uh, when you exit the meeting, and we hope that we can count on you to complete that for us. Thank, Thank you. you.